Welcome everyone to Close Reading Poetry. Uh, today in this video I'd like to introduce you to two of Reginald Dwayne Betts' poems. Betts is an African-American contemporary poet who is deeply rooted in the traditions of the Bible and English literature. I thought it'd be an interesting case study to show how contemporary poets are not so divorced from traditions or classical and Bible backgrounds as, as they sometimes might seem. I also want to give a word about allusions themselves. This week, we're, this month and next month, we're talking about backgrounds in English poetry. And this month, we're going through uh, the King James Bible with two lectures, how to read the Bible and the other on how English poets read the Bible. And then next month, we're going to be exploring classical literature uh, as a background to English literature. Someone in a comment uh, on YouTube in one of the videos said that they don't think that the Bible is very important for contemporary poets because more people are writing poetry without the knowledge of the Bible than there were 200, 300 years ago. And that's certainly true. But I'm not sure that contemporary poets are so divorced from biblical and classical traditions as we might think. You know, if you look at the King James Bible and its influence on black American poetry. It's enormous and it continues to be a, a great repository of literature and knowledge and illusions and ghosts and memories that appear all throughout this tradition. You know, it's in Langston Hughes and Gwendolyn Brooks, Rita Dove, Tracy K. Smith, and many others. Reginald Dwayne Betts is another one who relies on, in, in interesting ways, on scripture. Sometimes like in his poem, Losing Her, the comparison is, is, is one of despair in which the speaker of the poem who's losing uh, a partner in a breakup is, is, is compared el elusively to Christ. And the tragedy is that the comparison is that Christ brings redemption and he cannot effect it. Um, I think that's, that's how I read the dynamic of the ghost of the Bible in that poem. But there are two other poems that I think are really important that demonstrate how even contemporary poets are drawing upon the Bible and literary traditions in ways that we might not acknowledge. Christopher Ricks has a book on illusions in poetry, and in it he says that uh, in a good poem, readers are rewarded by recognizing the illusion, but it is not required that they recognize it. So our enjoyment and understanding of the poem is not inhibited by our own ignorance. It can stand alone as its own object. Now, our enjoyment and understanding of the poem will certainly be enhanced if we understand those illusions, and that's what he means by rewarding. Illusions, of course, are different from plagiarism, um, as Ricks describes. When a poet plagiarizes, he hopes, he or she hopes, that uh, the reader will not recognize it. In the illusion, the poet hopes that the reader will recognize it, and so this illusion really helps. Reginald Dwayne Betts, in the end of his book, Felon, this is a small collection of poems, partly about his experience in prison uh, and out of prison and life after prison. Really, really interesting poems, beautifully crafted. He's got an ear for music and he's also just steeped in the literary traditions. Two poems I wanna look at. But before I do, let me read you what Reginald Duane Betts says on page 95 of this book. He's talking about his own poetry making. He says, I've always thought of my own writing as having something of the desire of the quilt maker a book filled with thousands of words will sometimes have a few moments, echoes of the works of others, homages to poems and poets that gave me voice and belief, or, as my friend Patrick Rosehall describes it, this is the very Filipino practice of embedding something borrowed, grafted into what you are making as a way of praise, prayer, singing. It's all prayer to me, by which I mean a kind of devotion, discovery through attention. I always recast the line, present it in a way that makes of it something new, situated in a way that adds layers to the experience. Figuratively, it's called illusion. Where I'm from, it's just called a shout out. The aim is for it to be recognized immediately, like seeing an old friend. When I say a big verse, I'm only bigging up my brother. This book is no different, and it is all prayer, the kind that sustained me when I had no name for God. Sometimes you'll hear some people talk about illusion as if it's just the poet trying to show off how much he or she knows about a tradition, and that's not at all what it is. I love the way he describes it. 
like the recognition of an old friend. And so we're going to see some of these recognitions in a poem. And I want to direct your attention to this heartbreaking poem called When I Think of Tamir Rice While Driving. And Tamir Rice was a young boy, young black boy in Cleveland who was playing with a toy pistol and was shot by a police officer. In the back seat, my sons laugh and tussle, far from Tamir's age, adorned with his complexion and cadence, and already warned about toy pistols, though my rhetoric ain't about fear, but dislike, about how guns have haunted me since I first gripped a pistol. I think of Tamir, twice blink, and confront my weeping's inadequacy, how some loss invents the geometry that baffles the Second Amendment, cold and cruel, a constitutional violence, a ruthless thing worrying me still, should be, it predicts, the heft in my hand. Arm sag, burdened by what I bear, my bare arms, collaged with wings, as if hope alone can bring back a buried child, a child, a toy gun, a blue shield's rapid, rapid, rapid shit. This is how misery sounds my boys playing in the back seat, juxtaposed against a twelve-year-old's murder playing in my head. My tongue cleaves to the roof of my mouth. My right hand has forgotten. This is the brick and mortar of the America that murdered Tamir, and may stalk the laughter in my back seat. And he goes on. We've only reached half the poem. Now I just want to stop there. My tongue cleaves to the roof of my mouth. My right hand hand has forgotten. This is the brick and mortar of the America that murdered Tamir. This is a biblical allusion and it's an important one. It comes from Psalm 137, which we have here. For context, Psalm 137 was written by the exiles of Israel when they were taken captive into Babylon for several decades. It was written by someone there who was in exile and who was asked to sing and be happy by the oppressors of Babylon. And this is the song. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom, and now the psalm begins into its imprecatory mode, calling down justice from God to the oppressors. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem. Um, the Edomites, technically a, a cousin nation to the Israelites, who stood by and actually helped the Babylonians uh, take over Jerusalem and offered no assistance, who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundations thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. And here is one of the most um, shocking and talked about imprecatory statements mentioned in the Psalms. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. Now there's a certain way of reading the Psalms and there's a reason why uh, this imprecatory statement calling for justice he is so harsh, and it has to do with the period of exile. Uh, but just place that, like, as a diptych in conversation with Reginald Betts's poem on Tamir Rice, and you'll see the the connections just kind of rise up between not just the Black American experience and the Jewish experience in Babylon, but also the call for social justice, a sense of helplessness, a sense of uh, this demand that they be no longer a burden, but sing a happy song. There's a lot here, and it's and it's important to the poem, and yet the poem exists apart from this illusion. So if you were to read it and not know what this meant, that one line would be wasted on you, but the entire poem would not be wasted. Uh, but at the same time, you see how just that subtle illusion enriches the entire poem 
connects it to this larger history and tradition and then contextualizes it within this larger redemptive history of, of, of Christianity and of, of Scripture, hearkening even back to the Jewish uh, poets in the Hebrew Bible. So that's one example of how just the subtle allusion can really enrich an entire poem. There's one other poem uh, by Reginald Betts that I want to bring your attention to, and that's House of Unending. And I think it's a title that's taken from Psalm 23. Um, this is not the phrase, I would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Um, the way Betts sometimes uses scriptural allusions, at least in this book, Felon, he'll turn it on its head. He'll create the demonic anti-type of the illusion. And that's what he's doing in House of Unending. That's part of how, you know, you can use... You can use scriptural allusions many different ways. You can use it reverently, you can use it piously and impiously, and you can parody it as Dickens sometimes does, or you can turn it on its head into something that's to accentuate the evil of a certain state. And the house of unending is another term here in this poem for prison. It's a series of sonnets. It's a series of seven sonnets woven together the first line of this poem, the sinner's bouquet. Love that. House of shredded and torn, dear John letters. It, it's a list poem, a catalog poem, much like George Herbert's Prayer One, which begins the church's banquet, prayer, the church's banquet, and then he goes on to describe prayer. Angel's age, God's breath in man, returning to his birth, the soul in paraphrase, heart in pilgrimage, uh, it's just a description of prayer. Beautiful poem by George Herbert, a devotional poet of the early 17th century. And there's the ghost of Herbert here. The sinner's bouquet. Not the church's banquet. House of the unending. The sinner's bouquet. Here's a list that's describing the house of unending. Now what's interesting, so this is great. The sinner's bouquet. A bouquet is a collection of flowers, which if you don't know... Um, is the etymological root of the word anthology, a group of poems. Uh, anthos from the Greek means flower, uh, logi, a collection of, so an anthology is a collection of flowers. Poems have often been figured as flowers, and so what we have here is a series of seven sonnets, a bouquet of flowers. But this flower is not um, this bouquet, this anthology is not one that's dealing with the joys of human experience, but something very dark. House of Unending. So we have the Sinner's Bouquet, House of Shredded and Torn Dear John Letters. That enjambment here, this unfinished line that makes us to hold this line in our he heads, not really knowing where it's going until we reach here, this tender phrase, Dear John Letters. So the way this sequence is constructed is it interlocks like a crown. There are seven sonnets, four, fifth, but you'll see that each one begins with a line, the sinner's bouquet, house of shredded and torn, and ends with the line that is picked up by the next poem, of lockdown, hunger time, and the blackened flower. Here again is the return to flower, so these poems all have a certain unity. Now as notice, this is the last line of, son of sonnet one. Here it's picked up by two. So it's woven together, much like John Donne's La Corona, a series of holy sonnets. Now, um, when you think of John Donne's holy sonnets, you might think of those that batter my heart, three-person God for you as yet. But that was not the first sonnet sequence of devotional poems that, that John Donne wrote. He actually wrote this for Lady Danvers, who was George Herbert's mother and a patron of John Donne. And he does the same thing, seven sonnets, doing the exact same thing, Dain at my hands, this crown of prayer and praise. So the sonnets are becoming a crown woven like you might weave flower stems together to make a, a crown with. Salvation to all that will is nigh. Here we have it here, picked up again. Last line of the, of the second sonnet is picked up in the first line of the third, all the way till you get to sonnet seven, which ends the way the sonnet sequence began. Dain at my hands, this crown of prayer and praise. The House of Unending does the same thing. 
Sinner's Bouquet, How Shredded and Torn. Now let's go back up to the first sonnet. And you see how the ghosts of these past poets of John Donne, something very holy, full of belief, making a crown. Here, it's not a crown. It's not a la corona. It's, it's a crown of thorns in a way. The Lazarus of Hustlers is another biblical illusion. You can easily look all of these up. Uh, the paraphrase, a fractured, the small, um, in George Herbert's Prayer 1, we have soul and paraphrase. You know, he's, he's not stealing these poets' words. In some way, he's hoping that you've read these previous poets. And he's hoping to show how he's contributing to a conversation that's been going on in poetry for centuries. I have a lecture on placing poems in context in my series on how to read poetry. And I talk about how poems are not isolated events, but they're participating in this age-long conversation. Reginald Dwayne Betts is speaking to Dunn and Herbert as he's singing with the Hebrew poets. And his verbal utterance in the lyric is enriched by theirs, and it becomes a chorus. It's not just an isolated event. So you can see how literary knowledge really should be this organic thing, and that's the way it works in all poetry. Um, there's so much here to unpack in his poems, House of Unending. But hopefully that's a little teaser um, to check out his, his poems, just to give you an idea of how biblical poetry and biblical texts still inform contemporary poetry today. Thanks everyone for watching, and until next time.